Hello everyone, how's it going? So in the last video, we talked about the formation of ionic bonding with the formation of a cation and an aion, the reaction between a non-metal and a metal. But throughout this video, we're going to be focusing on covalent bonding, the type of chemical bond between two non-metals. Remember, non-metals typically have high ionization energies because they have strong nuclear charges, meaning that it takes a lot of energy to rip one of their valence shell electrons off. And because of this, they're not really willing to give up those electrons. They also have really beneficial electron affinity, meaning that they actually become stabilized or in lower energy when an electron gets added to their valence shell. So because we have atoms that don't want to donate their electrons, we're not going to have the formation of ions like we did with ionic bonding. In the course of covalent bonding, we're going to have the sharing of electrons. This sharing of electrons comes from merging electron densities or electron clouds so that both atoms can experience or share the electrons to fill their valence shell. On the top, you can see that I made an example of a covalent bond between hydrogen and fluorine forming hydrofluoric acid. This is a covalent bond. You can see that their valent shells are merging and each of them are sharing one electron. So it's as if fluorine's valent shell is filled and so is hydrogen's by that sharing or merging of the valent shell. Fluorine only needs one more electron to fill its valence shell. It's only going to make one bond with hydrogen so that it can fill its valence shell. Whereas nitrogen, we can see that it needs three more electrons. So it has the possibility of making three covalent bonds, each time sharing one electron. So for example, nitrogen and hydrogen, nitrogen will bond to three different hydrogen atoms to form ammonia. Let's talk about those sharing of electrons. When the two atoms share electrons and merge their valence shell, there's an ideal length the two atoms want to be at. If they're too close, then the like charges of the nucleus will repel one another and spike the covalent bond and energy. But if they're too far away, they won't be attracted to one another. So there's an ideal bond length where it's ruled by attractive forces between the two nuclei and the electrons in between, and not a repulsive force between the two nuclei. And this is where we have ideal bond length. When that ideal bond length is achieved, the covalent bond between the two atoms would be in lower energy than the two atoms separately. Because remember, non-metals have favorable electron affinity, so they actually lower in energy when they can fill their valence shell. In this graphic, we saw our first example of covalent bonding with hydrogen and fluorine, where each of the atoms is sharing one electron for a total of two electrons in that covalent bond but it doesn't always have to be that way we can have double and triple bonding double bonding when each of the atoms shares two electrons for a sharing of four and triple where each of the atoms shares three for a total of six in that bond easy way to show the comparison between single, double, and triple bonding is between the bonding types between two carbons. For example, a carbon atom needs four electrons to fill its valence shell. So we can either do one bond to carbon and three bonds to hydrogen, and that's where we have ethane, where each of the carbons are attached to three hydrogens. But we can also have ethene where the two carbons are double bonded to one another and each of the carbons are only attached to two hydrogens. This is because we have two bonds to hydrogen and the other two bonds are to the other carbon. With the triple bond example, we have ethyne. Each of the carbons are triple bonded to one another, meaning that they only have to be bonded to one other hydrogen. There's no fourth bonding, fifth bonding, sixth bonding. The max is triple. As we mentioned, a single bond is the sharing of two electrons. A double is a sharing of four and triple is six. As we increase the number of electrons between the two nuclei of the bonding atoms, 
we're going to increase in the attractive forces between the two atoms. As we increase in that attractive force, we're going to be shortening the bond length. And as we shorten the bond length, we're going to increase in the bond energy. So a triple bond has more bond energy than a double bond, and a double bond has more bond energy than a single bond. But honestly, that's not even the most exciting thing about covalent bonding. Remember when we were talking about atoms and how we talked about that different atoms have different nuclear charges and pull on their valence shells. This is also going to affect the electrons they share. If we have two different atoms that have a different tether on their valence shell electrons, then the sharing is not going to be equal. We talk about this pool on shared electrons as an atom's electronegativity. It increases towards fluorine, as we can tell because the small atomic size and the increase of nuclear charge being at the end of a group. So, if we have two atoms that are on the same electronegativity spectrum, we're going to have an equal sharing, as we can see here with ethane. Both of the carbons have the same pool on those shared electrons, so they're shared equally. But what about methyl bromine? Carbon and bromine are going to have a different relationship with those shared electrons. The shared electrons are going to get pulled towards bromine. And as we know, electrons are charged particles. So if we move these charged particles towards a certain direction, well, we're going to have a polarizing charge. This is how we create a polar covalent bond where the bond between the two carbons is non-polar covalent, the bond between bromine and carbon and methyl bromine is going to be polar covalent with a higher concentration of electron density near the bromine than the carbon. We form a polar covalent bond, we're gonna form a dipole. This is the direction of the separation of charges. This is a vector quantity, so it represents the direction in which the negative charges are moving. As we see here in the animation of hydrobromic acid, see how the bromine pulls on the shared electrons? So the greater density of electrons is by the bromine. This is going to give the bromine a partial negative charge and the area of the hydrogen with a low electron density a partial positive charge. These partial charges aren't as strong as the permanent charges we saw before with ionic bonding, but they are strong enough to give a lot of different properties and intermolecular forces with polar covalent molecules, but we'll talk about this in a future video. Talking about polarizing electrons to a certain region doesn't just refer to polar covalent molecules such as bromomethane or hydrobromic acid. We can also talk about polarizing an atom. If we have atoms in a magnetic field, we can polarize them. But different atoms have a different measure of polarizability. The larger the atom is and the least strength the atom has on its valence shell electrons, the easier the atom is to be polarized. For example, in the animation here, we see that iodine is a lot easier to be polarized than fluorine, since its large atomic size has it a weaker interaction with its valence shell electrons. Just a little interesting note with the conversation of polarity and polarizability. Well, that's it for our video about covalent bonding, at least the introduction. Don't worry, we'll be talking a lot about covalent bonds moving forward. In the next future videos, we're going to be talking about stoichiometry. And remember, all the graphics you see me use throughout this video are for free download on my website. And have a great day! Thank you.